Just shy of 28 years ago, I had hair. I was skinnier. I only had one chin. Um, yeah, same, same height, same short guy. The, one of the fun things about doing weddings and, and talking to couples, one of the, right at the end of it, you've done all the I do's and you've committed and all, and you get them to turn around. And typically, this means I get to be up because I'm so short, so I can't really see over couples. For the very first time, I present to you, Mr. and Mrs. And Kay and I got to hear the name John Elmore. And it's fun because when they're coming into that, that spot, they're, they're racing into claiming that new identity. I was no longer just John. It was, and it's still this way, it's John and Kay. I'm still claiming that identity 28 years later. This picture, that's my bride, right? Many of you who have been around me, you hear me refer to Kay as my bride. She's still my bride. And we are still Mr. and Mrs. John Elmore, Jr., I guess. But you know what? Sometimes, okay, you can make that. I don't want them to, I don't want anybody to see me that skinny for that long. Then you'll want to see how much I lied on my driver's license, right? But do we come and just as excitedly as we claimed that new identity on our wedding day? Or if for those of you who aren't married, to think about what that moment's going to be like? Because, by the way, if I find that when we're doing premarital, you're not excited about that new identity, I'm like, can we talk after we're done? But do we run and claim that identity that I was pointing to with those kids just as excitingly? That I am a follower of Christ. Do I let that identity as a follower of Christ impact all of me? Or do I have it off in that one little spot? It's like, I got my Jesus over here. He's not getting over here. Huh. In our world today, in our Western culture, there is many times I wonder how well we work at claiming our identity in Christ. Both individually within the community of believers and even out in our community as a whole. That we're afraid to let Jesus have all of us. We're afraid to let him impact every part of me. You get the benefit of me seeing and messing this up at 10 o'clock. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, and I'm going to read the chunks with each point versus trying to read 11 verses to you at one time, so that we can just kind of unpack it and see what it really might mean when we claim our identity as a Christ follower, as a Christian. Uh, by the way, if you're reading and you want to go back and look at this passage as a whole, the first 10 verses of this are really about Christ coming and, and taking rule in our life, not just as I got my ticket punched on the bus to heaven, but I have him as Lord and Savior. Because if it's just a ticket punch, you've got him off in one spot and afraid to let him in the other. And I realized probably when I accepted Jesus, that's probably all I could grasp. But he changes us so that it's across all parts. But listen at how it starts to look when we start truly accepting our new identity. He says, Therefore, remember that formerly you were, you who are Gentiles by birth, are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. That'd be Jews, which is done in the body by human hands. 
remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promises without hope and without God in the world. He says, remember, at one point you didn't know Jesus and you couldn't belong to those Christians. You couldn't belong to the church. Okay, let's take Jew, Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised out of it. Believer, or no, believer, unbeliever. Got it? At that point, if you're standing over here in the unbeliever category, I don't have an identity in Christ, do I? Then he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. At the end of the service, we're going to celebrate communion. He said, I came so that you might know me, that I might come and that I might pay the price for your sin. Along the way, we made a decision. We became a Christ follower. He says, when you come at that moment, he says, I come and offer you peace. In, in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he says, when you came to that moment, you came and were offered to be a child of God. One of the ways I always identify myself, and we joked about it and we talked about it several weeks ago, is... I told you who I was over and over. John Clarence Elmore Jr. We're talking about our identity in Christ. Okay? And individually, we have to get that. Let me just ask you, as a follower of Christ, who wins when you argue with Jesus? You say, I don't argue with Jesus. You don't ever run into something in Scripture you don't like and go, I ain't sure about that. Because we have him over there in a box all by himself and afraid to let him enter part of it, then all of a sudden you're having an argument with Jesus. Because he says, I want to be Lord of all. That ultimately ought to be peace for you. When you identify yourself as a Christ follower, individually it ought to bring peace. I understand when you're arguing with Jesus, you go, well, where's the peace in that? That's part of sanctification is the big the big churchy word. It's part of growing in Christ. By the way, every time I argue with him, I keep losing. Because he's God and I'm not. And if you are arguing with him, then you have a God that's made in your image and not in his. Because none of us is perfect. But when you start identifying, he will bring you peace. I think about and. Tracy just prayed a minute ago for Dan Smith and his family at the passing of Dan's son. And there shall be peace. I think about the people who are literally waiting on Irma. And I pray that they might know him. And ultimately in that storm there is peace. I think about the people that I saw in the hospital yesterday. Two of our family. I'm praying for their peace. That out of that identity, that they might know it. How is it that he is bringing you peace? And and I promise you, he does not fix every storm that comes your way, but he'll walk with you. Okay? Let me keep going. 14 through 18. One of the things in the very first part of this is is that peace part. It talks about our relationship with other people. When we as a church need to understand, if I'm a Christ follower, that identity means that how my relationships look ought to be different. He says, for he himself is our peace, who was made the two groups, those two groups didn't get along. He made those two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall 
of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostilities. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. All of a sudden, Jesus says, when I came, there ought to be this idea of reconciliation. Man, I don't like watching the news. How much peace is there in our communities and in our country today? What are the things that divide us? I'll let you speak. What are the things that divide us? Politics do divide us. Come on, y'all. Religion divides us. What are most of us in here? Anglo. Race divides us today. How about education? How about social structure? How about garnet and orange? How about greenwood and emerald? Or Ohio State, Michigan, whatever. There is much in this world that we allow to divide us, right? He says, I came to take away all of that stuff and make one body, one group. And when I start identifying as a Christ follower, he says, it ought to take those divisions away. And I cringe when I see you with your orange. I don't want to look when Paige has got it on on Fridays in the office. He says, I came for you to be one and united. And for us to completely be who we are called to be, we have to understand that there ought to be a reconciliation. We are part of a bigger group. The other passage that would be easy to preach this, is, preach this out of is 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, this is verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, as you come to Christ, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you are like a living stone. You're being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. gotten so used to being on the floor Hackett's have children just had a new one not long ago that we baptized several weeks ago and all of a sudden they're part of his household right he and Stephanie my two kids they're part of my household they identify with that he said, when you start claiming that new identity in Christ, you are part of God's household. The verse I quoted to you out of John, you are children of God. We are brothers and sisters. Those that are divided, like that tiger paw. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, I come that new identity in Christ brings reconciliation. How's it doing with your reconciliation? How is it doing when you are claiming that as who you are? Are you still got Jesus over in one part of your life afraid to give him all of it? Because at that point you remember you're back to arguing with God and you're supposed to lose. If you don't lose... You didn't let him be Lord and Savior. 
you may think I got my ticket punched. he's not winning, then I'm not sure your ticket's punched. But listen at how that develops out. When I start identifying in, as a Christ follower. That means learner, by the way. Christ follower. Disciple. It means I've, I'm going to learn something. I'm going to follow it. I am going to change. He says in Finally, I'm going to put these on, 19 through 22. He said, consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. You're also members of his household. Right back to where we were, y'all. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. When we start understanding who we are as free campuses and four services and we start identifying as Christ followers together, the temple looks a little different. And in him, you who are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. When you start identifying as a Christ follower, it creates community. That when I was reading this, and every time I hear the word cornerstone, I think of that big rock in the corner of a brick building. It's got a date on it and tells us when the building was established, right? Right? At least that's my initial thought when I started, every time I hear the word cornerstone. But in the day that Jesus was built, the cornerstone wasn't one little rock on the, down out in the corner of the building. It was the rock that tied everything together. In one house, they found the, that main wall that was this massive rock. It weighed 250 tons. It weighed 500,000 pounds. When Irma would come to that, guess what? The stone is still there. Christ said, he is the cornerstone. When everything else goes, it's going to, that's going to be there. And he said, but we're a part of the brothers and sisters of Christ and we have a responsibility in our community so that others might see him. Uh, Peter Manning, when was Peter here? Two weeks ago? Talked about Good News Club. He was at Connection today. And, but the reality is when we start sharing that, we start sharing it in our community. We start living it out in our community. How are you doing as a Christ follower? That it matters in your community. Because when I start identifying that way, it changes how I see other people. Let me ask a question. Do you think who you are in Christ and who we are as a church, it ought to be attractive to other people? They ought to look at us and go, yeah, John loves Chuck. And that's cool. Chuck's a cowboy, and John's just a country redneck. They're like, Peter actually likes John. He's a lawyer. Runs his own business. But our love for other people ought to be strong enough to draw them in. They ought to see that. Because when they do, you know what they are seeing? They are seeing Jesus, not me individually or you individually, it's communal. Your identity in Christ brings about community. But if y'all don't, did Tracy, did you explain the Dan, um, Dan Smith losing his son? Okay, Dan Smith is one of the pastors in our area. Um, Tammy Marshall, it's Tammy Marshall's stepdad. So 
we get a phone call that the sun passed Friday, part of the evacuations um, due to the hurricane. So Dan's a pastor, and what can we do? Well, that's where Andrew's preaching today. That's why he's not here. Why some of our roles changed today. So that we could love somebody in a different way. We could look at our brother that's hurting. How's that looking for you? Second Peter, let me give you that last verse. Second Peter verses nine and ten. It's first Peter chapter two, nine and ten, sorry. Listen at this ought to be daunting this these first few words to you individually, but also to other believers. You are a chosen people. A chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession. Gosh, there is so much there. Dean Lawless's mind is spinning on the back row. You are chosen. A priesthood doesn't mean one, does it? We are called the priesthood of believers. Not just me, Steve and Andrew, and you name the pastors that have come before us. We are the priesthood of believers. Said, then all of a sudden you start thinking about our other places in our own church. I start thinking about Dan's church and the folks in our district or the Baptists or the Presbyterians and throughout our community. And he says, and you are made into a nation because a people, a household, a nation, a priesthood of believers isn't one. When I start identifying as a Christ follower, all of a sudden I've stepped into something a little bigger, haven't I? It means that I ought to look at the people around me a little differently as a Christ follower. How's it impacting who you are and where you are today? Because when, here's the thing we're trying to, I'm trying to get you to remember today. When you identify as a Christ follower, it ought to bring you peace. But it also ought to bring you into connection of community with others. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that means I look at folks around me a little differently. That means when the graves are sitting up here because they're hiding from the hurricane which didn't come, that's all right. We're glad they're here. They're still my brothers and sisters, even though they're living on the coast now. It means that when I see somebody that looks or acts a little differently or they might not be the country redneck that I am, they still go, I still see them as my brother and sister in Christ. How is it that your identity in Christ will impact your own peace tomorrow? And how will it help you see those around you? He said, I came so that you might have peace, that you might walk together with your brothers and sisters together. One of the greatest examples of that we're about to celebrate. Communion. We're about to to see his table open. We start to understand, because who's it open to? Somebody tell me. It's open to everyone. Just as Christ came. And so we are part of the whole. Let me pray for you about what we just preached about. Be prepared to come and take communion with us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can be in your house. I thank you that you didn't just come for one of us. You came for all. Father, I thank you that I get to have my brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us see 
who we are in you and who our brothers and sisters are and who are those that are around us that aren't in that body yet so that they might join that there might be a celebration because we see that let us love well Lord love each other and loving you it's in Jesus name we pray Amen.